So um, I'm glad you're here. Our in-person attendance is um, small, but we always like to host people here at the firm. Uh, but we have a lot of people, I understand, on the webinar too. Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Beth West. I'm a shareholder here at Weintraub and chair of the Labor and Employment <laughs> Department. I may be a little slow this morning. I have a little pinch nerve thing going on. So I apologize for that. Um, and I am here with my associates, um, Katie Collins and Rachel Davies. And today we're going to talk to you about a really um, beefy uh, area of employment law uh, that's also very complex and actually really important if you're kind of flying by the seat of your pants uh, on this subject. Um, we really can just give you an overview um, because this topic could take days and days and days for us to really peel apart in depth for you. So uh, hopefully you'll walk away with some good information. And then of course, if you've got particular issues of your own, we're always happy for you to reach out to us. Um, today we are in person and live and webinar, as I said, I'm gonna read my uh, required introductions from, my, uh, from our assistant Ramona. Uh, for those of you in uh, attendance, be sure to pick up your HCRI. HRCI or NCLE forms, they're right over here on the table, so you get um, some credit for today's education. And then webinar attendees, the knee blast went out shortly before the webinar with a copy of the PowerPoint presentation and information about how you get your credit for HRCI or NCLE. Um, if you registered late yesterday or early this morning, a second class is going to go out after the webinar that will also have those materials for you. Um, also, there will be a link. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, educational materials and resources for our clients in the business community. Uh, there'll be links to our labor and employment law blog, our California employment news video and podcast series that we make available now, as well as our COVID-19 resource hub. Um, we're not going to use chat today because we've got so much material to cover for those of you on the webinar, but if you do have a burning question, go ahead and type it in Q&A. If we have time, we'll get to it or address it with you uh, after the uh, seminar. So with that, you guys have anything to add? We'll get going. All right. Okay. So this is a very intimate in-person um, in person gathering, but I know there's a lot of people in the webinar. I'm told to stand right around here so that you can uh, see me and hear me. So we're just going to get started. Uh, I've already introduced everybody. Why are we here? What are we going to talk about today? Um, why proper classification matters. If you just wing it and get it wrong, you're going to learn today there can be some serious consequences. We're going to tell you who cares about misclassification or proper classification. It's not just the individual, him or herself, but a bunch of federal and state agencies uh, care about it. Uh, we're going to talk about the ABC test that I'm sure you've heard uh, on the news and down the hallway of your business and probably at other webinars and seminars given by us and other employment lawyers. ABC test is the test. If you don't know your ABCs, you're in trouble. Um, the statutory exemptions from ABC tests, there are some, right, uh, outlined in the labor code, but just be uh, cautious, as we'll talk about, uh, even if you meet one of those exemptions, it does not mean that you've properly classified somebody as an independent contractor. And then we're going to talk about the legal risks of misclassification, okay, the consequences. Okay, why does the government care? how two people classify their relationship, right? If we have two adults who say, I would like to enter into an independent contractor agreement, would you like to enter into an independent contractor agreement? And they're both consenting adults, why can't they do it, right? Why does the government care? This is the rationale that we hear from federal and state governmental agencies. It deprives workers of employee benefits. As you guys know in California, we're a highly, highly regulated state when it comes to employment law, right? Uh, very employee friendly. And so we have really complex and hyper technical wage and hour laws that guarantee employees minimum wage and overtime and expense reimbursement and meal and rest periods, um, which you don't see under federal law or a lot of other state laws, uh, workers' compensation benefits all kinds of statutory leave and accommodation benefits are provided to employees 
And then, of course, if you have your own discretionary benefits that you provide to employees or medical coverage, all of that, um, theoretically, you don't have to provide to a true independent contractor. And so, you know, the government cares if you misclassified workers in order to essentially circumvent that obligation, right, to provide those benefits. And then the rationale is that it also burdens workers um, from other kinds of obligations like taxes, income taxes, unemployment contributions, uh, state disability insurance, uh, and so forth. You know, they, they, they have to pay for their own business expenses and, and so forth. So that's why the government scrutinizes it. And we'll talk at the end of the seminar today about which governmental agency is focused on what and what their enforcement power is. So who regulates it? Here they are. We're gonna go into this in detail. I'm gonna tell you what they can do, what potential penalties are at the end of the seminar, but look at all of those governmental agencies that have a vested interest. Um, and I put the courts here because obviously if you are misclassifying a single person or a group of people, those individuals themselves could pursue an action against you for that misclassification in court, okay? Here, I already started with this. Consenting adults should be allowed to enter? Not so. Here's the starting premise. Independent contractor status is not an election. It is not an election, okay? Um, you're gonna find out, because Rachel's gonna get up here and tell you, there is a presumption now, employment. And then we go from there to see if we can turn the person into or properly classify them as an independent contractor under the applicable test. All kinds of tests. This is what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to focus mainly on um, California tests, but I wanted you to know that there are particular tests under federal law. The DOL, Department of Labor, and the IRS have their own tests. Most of these tests have similarities. Uh, when you look at them, the major or one of the most important factors is the right of control, right? The hiring entity, the principal's right to control the manner and means in which the worker is doing whatever you've retained them to do, okay? Um, and what test applies depends on, you know, how we're analyzing it, what agency we're being scrutinized by, what, what claims are being made in court and so forth. Um, but you'll hear from Rachel and then um, Katie, that you know, there's two main tests in California, that's the ABC test and the Borello test. Okay, I'm going to just fly through this. This kind of just tells you which test usually applies, but that'll be explained a little bit more. Um, the uh, DOL test is very similar to the economic reality test by the EEOC. And then the IRS used to have a 20 factor test, pretty long, but now it's kind of grouped into three factors. Again, we're not gonna focus on these federal tests today. We just don't have the time. We're gonna be focusing on the ABC test and the Borello test today, okay? So with that, I'm gonna turn it over, but I just wanted to give you this kind of um, visual so that you could see the evolution of where we're at today. So Borello we had for years, it's based on a case. Then we had the Dynamax case. Then we had uh, Assembly Bill 5 codifying uh, the Dynamax case. Then there was some cleanup legislation to AB5 under AB2257. And then there's this limited Prop 22 that Katie's gonna talk to you about that I don't think it's gonna apply to anybody in this room but we want you to be aware of that, okay? So let's jump off into the details. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Beth mentioned, my name is Rachel Davey. I'm an associate in Wine Shop Labor and Employment Group. And the first thing I'm going to be talking to you all today about is the ABC test. Um, as Beth mentioned, uh, this is our new starting point. It came from this case on April 30th, 2018, Dynamex. Uh, you all might've heard about this case. Dynamex was a company kind of like Postmates where you could hire someone to come make a delivery for you. And actually until 2004, 
all of these workers were classified as employees. And then in 2004, Dynamex decided we could make a lot of savings if we reclassified everyone as independent contractors. That way, they're responsible for providing their own vehicles, paying for their own gas, having their own insurance, all those things. So they did that. Um, some of the workers sued. Uh, it was a class action. And ultimately, this went up to the Supreme Court of California. And the Supreme Court found that, first of all, there is a presumption that they are employees, as Beth mentioned. Uh, and then they said that the burden is on the employer to establish that these workers are independent contractors after you consider the presumption. So that's where the ABC test comes in. And under the ABC test, the employer must show that the worker, first, the worker was free from control of the employer. Uh, second, the worker is performing work outside the usual course of the company's business. And third, uh, the worker is customarily engaged in an independent type of work. Uh, so that could be like, this law firm hiring someone to come paint the wall. Our custom is to be engaged in the work of law. They are painting a wall. So that would be an example. Okay, and then as Beth also mentioned, after the Dynamex decision came out that same year, uh, the California legislature took action and drafted Assembly Bill 5. And Assembly Bill 5 went into effect and uh, created by law now, or by statute, uh, this rebuttable presumption of employment uh, when a person provides labor or services unless the hiring entity can demonstrate that all conditions under the ABC test are satisfied. So again, this is basically codifying what the court already said in Dynamex, um, and that is where it came from. So here, I mentioned the three uh, elements of the ABC test before, but factor A, uh, this is the most important one. This was what our prior tests were all about, uh, is the control that the employer has over the worker or the hiring entity, the company. Uh, so you can think of A as autonomy, if you want, uh, because it, again, it's all about control. How much does the employer maintain control over how the worker performs the work for uh, the company? Uh, the B factor, I think you can think of business, B for business, uh, whether the business is outside the usual course of business of the hiring entity. So back to my example from before, Weintraub Tobin's usual business is law. We hire someone to come paint the wall. Their usual business is painting. So in that case, we could show that, you know, here's an example where for factor B of the ABC test, business is outside course of the usual business. And the last factor, factor C, uh, this is for customarily engaged in an independent work or trade. Must show that the worker has independently made the decision to go into business for himself or herself. Uh, steps taken to establish themselves as kind of a separate business entity. Maybe they form an LLC. Maybe uh, you know they have their own permits, licensing, their own advertising. Maybe they have their own. Uh, you know, brick and mortar location somewhere that's separate from the hiring entity. And of course, because nothing can be clear, uh, although we have the ABC test, there are exemptions to it. And the reason for this is because when the legislature decided to come in and codify uh, the decision that came out of Dynamex, a lot of different industries went into a panic, as you can imagine. Uh, they're very concerned. You know, we've always been independent contractors. This is going to change the way everything works. 
a lot of lobbying, and as a result, a lot of exemption. So um, we are going to go through some of these today. Um, really quick, I'm just going to jump back. Uh, the way that these exemptions work is the employer is not required to use the ABC test for these workers' claims if the employer establishes that the occupation falls within an exemption. So that doesn't mean you, you know, if you're the employer, you can establish this exemption. Okay, you're done there, an independent contractor. No, typically you then have to meet the original test before the ABC test and before Dynamex, which was the Borella test, which we'll get into. Okay, so here we have the exemptions. This is the code section that explains, you know, where these exemptions are coming from. All you need to know is if ABC doesn't apply, then Borella probably does. Here we have a list of some of the most common exemptions to the ABC test. And I'm gonna go through two of them with you, the first ones, and then uh, Katie, I believe will come in and uh, share about some of the others. And so again, this is just a reminder, um, if a relationship satisfies the elements of one statutory exemption, do not just assume the worker is an independent contractor. You still likely have to meet the Borello factors test. So um, I will say that oftentimes it's easier, a little easier to meet the Borello test just because it's a list of factors as opposed to the ABC test, which has three required elements. So you have to meet every single one versus Borello. There's a little bit more wiggle room there. So. Um, that's why these are so important. We're going to discuss five of the exemptions today. Uh, the first one is a business to business exemption. As you can see, uh, all 12 of the criteria are required. And in addition, it must pass the Borel test. So, you know, this isn't 12, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or, you know, this. It's, you must meet all 12 for the exemption to apply. Then once the exemption applies, you must meet Borello. So um, we're going to go into, uh, I'll stay here. Okay, so a business to business exemption. What is this? Who does this apply to? Uh, oftentimes it comes up in circumstances where one company uh, is hiring out work that is from another company. Uh, you know, this can come up in a motor carrier environment where they're, you know, a company is a motor carrier, they're hiring an owner operator to let's say truck something across the state. Um, you know, is it going to apply in that circumstance? We can take a look. Uh, another example is, you know, so a business service provider, in this case, uh, the statute defines it as a sole proprietorship partnership, LLC, LLP, or corporation. So this is when, you know, you're not just hiring an individual, you're hiring someone who is, in a way, touting themselves out as a separate business entity. Okay. And then um, the contracting business, in my example from before, would be the motor carrier, they'd be contracting the business service provider who would be the driver of the truck. Um, actually, in the, so in many cases, motor carriers actually do not fall under the business to business exemption because they're required to obtain uh, licenses from the state licensing board and other uh, parts of their job show that the hiring uh, or the contracting business has some control over what they're doing. Uh, but the business to business exemption can apply to motor carriers when let's say a trucking company hires a plumber to come do work for them. Yes. Okay, so I guess I'm a little confused. I'm, excuse me, I own a trucking company and I hire someone to drive something across the country one time. That person can get litigious and say, 
they were actually, I was working for them. I'm now an employee and I should be paid extra because my insurance should be paid by them. My extra expenses should be paid by them. So that's a good question. I think that the, you know, without knowing all the facts, the important thing to know is which test would apply. And so you would be looking at the business to business exemption and see if it applies. You would have to go through all of the 12 criteria that are required and then the Borello factors to see is this person an employee or an independent contractor? And then you would know your answer. Uh, if you think about it in a big scheme like this, kind of ridiculous. It's not that it's you know, but right. Wait before we make a phone call to Johnny's transport company. Let's let's double check how we're going to pay this person. Right. So the most important thing here, and um, you know, I'm sure we can all come back at the end and Beth can chime in too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, let me just say that one to dispel the notion that because it's just a one-time deal, uh, you can classify somebody as an independent contractor. You always have to start with the presumption of employment and then apply the applicable test to fit that person with it. <laughs> this is the framework that the California <laughs> legislature yeah. made for us. So um, the restaurant, somebody comes, not, not necessarily close mates, but if somebody comes to deliver or hey, Drop this off, whatever. I, I don't have to run a test to prove just in case someone gets crazy and says, I'm going to sue you because my car got into an accident and I, I need a drink. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't want to get too blind, but if you're talking about the only restaurant for you, you call, you use DoorDash and food delivery. You have not hired that person to come to work and perform services to you. You just no, in that case, you do not have to. The customer ordered DoorDash to pick up the customer. I have nothing to do with that other than convince the food. Okay, DoorDash, I have to worry about. DoorDash has to worry about whether that driver is coming to get some delivered that mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. Not me. If you would worry about every DoorDash person, you can get along. But yes. she <laughs> couldn't talk about how much she was paying. Sorry, I just, I got it. No, no, that was a great question. And that's a nice segue into. Uh, one of my last points here, uh, which is uh, one tip is that when hiring an independent contractor, be sure to request proof of their separate legal business entity, perhaps request proof of their business location, maybe a written contract, mm -hmm. a business license, those types of things, because that is uh, the type of information that you will need to know to be able to determine, you know, have they met these 12 elements and then pass the Borello factors to be deemed an independent contractor. All right, and then our next exemption that I'm talking about, again, we're just addressing five of the common ones today, is the referral agency's exemption. Um, and like the exemption before it has 11 criteria, all 11 must be met. And in addition to that, then you have the Borello test. And so here you can see we have go back, uh, started listing the criteria for you. Uh, basically, AB5 provides an exemption for business referring customers to providers for certain services, including things like graphic design, photography, tutoring, event planning, moving, minor home repairs, home cleaning, errands, furniture assembly, animal services, dog walking, dog grooming, web design, picture hanging, pool cleaning, and yard cleanup. And that is a complete list. Uh, and so here we have you know, all of these elements that uh, you must meet to show. Again, essentially the focus of this is control. You know, are you, are you hiring someone to clean your pool but you're running a pool cleaning company? And you're controlling, you know, the outfit they wear to work, what time they get there, what tools they use, the way that they clean the pool. That would be more indicative of employment. However, if you're just living at your house with a pool and you hire someone from a different company who's wearing a different company's uniform and their truck and their equipment to come over and clean your pool, and you have no control over how they do 
their job or you know micromanaging them at all, uh, then that is a lot more indicative of an independent contractor relationship. So you know keep that in your mind as we go through these. Um, but those 16 uh, industries are kind of what is involved with this referral agency exemption. If you think, you know, what is a referral agency? Uh, that's what we're talking about here. So, so just to clarify, is this like Angie List, where you would go online and and they would they would organize all of these vendors, but you would hire them indirectly, and they would Angie's List would just take a portion of it, or I don't know if I understand. Yes. That. Okay, yes. that's how you would. Okay, thank you. Sorry. And and let me just pop in here because I worked with a couple of clients who were part of the lobbying efforts to clean up and clarify some of these exemptions. Some of the clients are in the industries that really needed to um, be involved. And uh, it's a strange list. Can you advance the slide really quick? Yes. Look at the strange industry. Animal third dog walking, picture hanging, errands, yard cleanup. I mean, really? And um, so a lot of the lobbying efforts really impacted who was going to fit within some of these exemptions, including the referral agency exemption. So it would be like Angie's List, but only Angie's List in connection with these kinds of services, these industries. Yeah. And it's really that the independent contractor is not performing service for the referral agency, but the client that the referral agency is matching the independent contractor. And mm -hmm. note that like a full-on construction, you know, remodel or something is not this process. You know, Angie's list, like a lot of what we do, right? It's connecting you to someone who you want to remodel your kitchen or whatever it might be. If it's not considered a minor home repair, right. that's right. You're gonna have an issue with it. Okay. All right. And uh, now we will move on to the professional services exemption. And Katie, <laughs> and Katie will discuss these. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Are you still with us? <laughs> I know it's early. And you're a small group. It's nice to have a small group here. So as Beth said, I'm Katie Collins, part of the uh, labor and employment team here at Weintraub. And I'm just going to keep chugging along here on these exemptions that Rachel started. And hopefully we don't worry anyone else or need a drink or anything like that. We'll just keep moving through it. <laughs> You're good. You're good. All right. We'll move forward. So professional services exemption, um, six criteria. So this is a shorter list. This one can concern us a little less. Six criteria listed. And of course, once again, if it met, you still have to do the Borello test. You're not out of the list. Um, here, the individual must maintain their own business location. It can be their home. I think that's an important distinction because a lot of individuals will have some sort of home office that will work. It can be considered their business location. Um, they have to have an, an individual business license or tax registration if required in the jurisdiction where they're performing work and any required professional license or permit. And the individual has ability to set or negotiate rates. So this is someone that is considered a professional. They're coming in, engaging in this um, relationship with you. They have the ability to negotiate what they may or may not get paid for their services. And then outside of project completion dates, they have the ability to set their own hours. So the company can still say, I want it complete by this day, or my deadline for this service is this day. But within that boundary, so to speak, the person can determine how many hours a day they're going to work, how many hours a week they might be putting forth these services. And then this individual has to be customarily engaged in the same type of work being performed and hold themselves out to others to perform the same work. Lastly, individual customarily, customarily and regularly exercises discretion and independent judgment. So that's a really key thing. They have to have discretion and independent judgment because they're being considered a professional. And here is a list of the individuals that will be included in that area. Marketing, but it has to be work that's original and creative, similar to the independent judgment and the fact that we're considering them a professional. It can't just be someone coming in with very standard pulling templates from a 
online service and providing them to you. It needs to be someone that's original and creative. HR consulting is intellectual and varied. I think most of us would hope that all HR consulting is intellectual and we're not just <laughs> providing things standardly, right? Everyone's got some intellectual stuff that goes into play with our HR consulting. Uh, travel agents, graphic design, grant writer, that's obviously a really specific thing that's at play here. Fine arts, which has to be imaginative, aesthetic, or intellectual. So that same intellectual component because they have to be professional. Licensed enrolled agent, payment processing agent, appraiser, registered forester. That's a fun one. If you have any registered foresters, let us know. We'll help you with that. Uh, licensed esthetician, electro electrologist, manicurist, barber, or cosmetologist. That's probably obviously the most common one in terms of dealing with this because those people are renting space. Obviously, most of the people that we have doing our hair or our manicure or whatever might come up are, you know, may fall under this exemption and they may not be considered employees of the place that we're going to get our hair done or the actual establishment that we're visiting. Photographer, photojournalist, videographer, um, photo editor under written contract, not in motion pictures. So in the entertainment industry, that's an important differentiation right here. Digital content aggregator, freelance writer, content contributor, and then a specialized performer who teaches master class for one week. So the important part of all of these obviously is that this requires a level of expertise, a level of intellectual use of creativity, all of these aspects. It can't just be some standard line of work where, no, where you're not really using your brain, you're not really being creative. This is a, an exemption specific to those individuals that are putting forth their intellectual and creative abilities in applying these type of work. And then moving on to the single engagement exemption. So this one has eight conditions listed and the ABC test will not apply if neither individual is subject to control direction by the other. Each individual can negotiate rate of pay. The written contract specifies total payment and rate. Each individual maintains their own business location. Once again, that can be the home. It doesn't need to be a separate offsite location. And then each individual provides own tools and equipment as a part of the relationship. And then if work requires it, an individual has the required business licenses and tax registration. Now, as Rachel noted, anytime you're working through one of these exemptions, make sure that you're documenting. Obviously, that's always our, that's always our recommendation. Document everything, collect those documents. Don't just take someone's word for, yes, I have the, all, all, all the appropriate licenses and we're just gonna move forward on that sense. Gather the necessary documents to work through the analysis, document the fact that you did the analysis and that you met all of those criteria. Okay, Katie, uh -huh. I actually believe if you read closely the business business has a requirement that uh -huh. the hiring entity actually have a copy of the business license from the contractor and has to keep it on the file. Good, yeah, yeah. So yeah. definitely maintain that, keep it in your files, make sure you're documenting all the, the entire part of this process so that you can back it up. And I think, <laughs> especially in the line of um, manicurists and cosmetologists, they have to display those obviously even in the workforce. So not only there are additional requirements for some people in terms of business license that you, you have to maintain it, but they also have to actually put it out to the public in terms of providing their services. So make sure you're aware of those different requirements as well. Uh, going back to the single engagement exemption, each individual is customarily engaged in same or similar work performed under contract or holds themselves out to other potential customers to perform the same type of work. And then each individual can contract with others. So this is not something where you are tied to this only, only this one contract and you're not allowed to engage in other contracts or engage in other businesses. And um, this is just obviously a single engagement. That's why it's called, this is just your one contract that you're engaging in that doesn't prevent you from doing anything outside of that. And then a single engagement event means a standalone non-recurring event in a single location or a series of events at location no more than once a week. So this is not a recurrent ongoing relationship where someone's reporting every single day. And then single engagement exemption not allowed in these industries. High hazard industry, janitorial, delivery, courier, transportation, trucking, 
some of what we were talking about before, agricultural labor, retail, logging, in-home care, and construction services, other than the minor home repair, which we've already noted on that other referral agencies. And I just want to say this is really important, and uh, there was a lot of lobbying that was not successful in this uh, in this exemption. And the reason why these limitations are up here is that many state agencies that are concerned about wage and hour, workers' comp, OSHA issues, made very clear that they scrutinize certain industries, janitorial, ag, high hazard industry where OSHA injuries can happen. And they have gone in the past and cited those industries where they have improperly classified workers as independent contractors. So they made clear, you're never gonna be able to fit those industries within uh, this exemption or really any of the, the exemptions. That and we'll talk further, further obviously about delivery and the transportation part of that when we get to Prop 22. Because of course, when they were unsuccessful, they tried to uh, you know, take additional steps and move forward in lobbying. And I'm sure it will continue in the years to come as well, trying to figure out how to get around um, having these people be in place. Specific occupation exemption um, applies to people licensed by the California Department of Insurance or providing underwriting, inspections, audits. Here we've got physicians, surgeons, dentists, you know, psychologists, veterinarians, any kind of medical professional in that realm, licensed attorneys, architects, landscape ar architects. So these are very specific, obviously direct sales person, manufacturer housing salesperson, commercial fisher, so really, if you think that you fall under that, you're going to want to pay very close attention to what their actual job title is, what they believe, what they're representing as the services that they're providing, and whether they fall under that. And then obviously, any time that you're dealing with someone that has a specific occupation that requires some sort of a license, obviously, as an attorney, you have to be licensed. As a doctor, you have to meet certain requirements, taking those additional steps to make sure that they are actually qualified, holding themselves out to perform that specific occupation. And then the still very important Borello test. So as we talked about, just because you meet the exemption does not mean you stop there. Um, you have to go through the Borello test. And as Rachel mentioned before, that one is relatively easier to um, get by than the ABC test. ABC test, you have to meet all three. Borello test is a weighing of factors and there are quite a few factors. So, you know, if you're not so great on one, but you have several others in your ballpark, that might be something that you can weigh and assess. And I will say about the Borrello test in particular, obviously that's a very case-by-case -case assessment because weighing of factors can be relatively gray area and you're gonna to wanna to seek legal counsel if you have any sort of qualms about going through that process. So this goes back to 1989, um, the Borrello case. And the issue in that case was whether agricultural laborers engaged to harvest cucumbers under written share farmer agreement are independent contractors exempt from workers' compensation. So this was particularly noted, like we talked about before, whether or not workers' compensation had to be paid for these people. And the California Supreme Court established the multi-factor test to determine if workers were independent contractors or employees. So obviously when we when we have that fun little chart that moved across, this is the start of our start of our chart on that one back in 1989. And then the big thing here is whether or not the principal has necessary control over the manner and means. That's the most key part of the Borrello test. Manner and means of how a worker accomplishes work, even if control is not exercised. Now, control over the results is different. You can have no control over the manner and means, but still require a certain level of quality. That's important when people are, especially, you know, delivering products, things of that nature, you can still require that your product get to the customer in, in good condition. And, you know, the boxes aren't falling apart. The, the produce isn't laying in the back of the truck, whatever those requirements are. That's not controlling the manner and means, that's controlling the quality of the work. And then 13 additional factors. So like I said, a lot of factors to take into play here and weigh. No one factor is determinative. So, as mentioned, there are some where you might not be so great on and others that might swing the other way. You have to look at all of them and do that totality of circumstances um, review and figure out where you land here. Does worker hold himself out as being engaged in occupation or business distinct from its principle? So that's something where 
Rachel was discussing earlier, a similar line of concept with if someone's going to come in here and paint the wall. We are a law firm. We don't paint walls for a living. We don't offer painting services as a living. Figuring out is what the business is doing different than what this individual is coming in and providing as their service. Is work a regular or integral part of the principal's business? Who provides instruments, tools, and place of work? Is the worker invested in the business, such as equipment or materials needed to perform the work? So a lot of times if you're having someone come in that is performing a service that's not typical in nature of your business, they're going to be bringing in their tools, right? The, the painter might be bringing in paint supplies, might be bringing in different things that make it easier for him to paint the ceiling, whatever it might be. That's not something that you typically are doing within your line of business. Do services require a special skill? Is work usually done under direction of principal or usually done without supervision? That goes back to the manner and means. Does worker have an opportunity to profit or loss depending on managerial skill? The length of time for which services are performed by the worker? Degree of permanence of working relationship? Method of payment by time or by job? Can the worker hire his or her own employees? or independent contractors if they then meet their own <laughs> requirement. It's likely not, but you know, we'll let them work through that on their own. Does the principal have the right to fire worker at will? And then belief of worker in principle as to the nature of relationship. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Whatever happened to a handshake? <laughs> <laughs> California doesn't care. <laughs> it's, it's not yeah. Yeah. I mean no one really cares. Oh, yeah, that's it's, there's some truth to that. Right, and then the unfortunate part is even if you have a handshake with someone that you might trust, and that always is what we see happen. Someone that was trusted, that was an ad, you know, a business partner. Yep, yeah, a business partner, whoever they are, and then all of a sudden, not so friendly anymore, and you've got a problem. So handshake is not what's going to be your life. So Borello basically was a was an owner of a farm or something, and hired workers to work on the farm. Yeah, cucumbers. Yeah. Okay, cucumbers. So even though Borello. Uh, the, the, the farm hired a company of uh, laborers. When the laborers came on working under that company, mm -hmm. they came onto the Burrell farm. The Burrell farm is now their employer, no matter what. Beth is waving her you, you made an assumption that all those workers were um, working for a labor company. Right, they were just bringing in retained. But they were all classified as independent contractors, farm workers. Uh, we have a whole other area of law under the California Labor Code dealing with farm labor contractors and their relationships with right. farmers, which is separate. But here, there's no intermediary. No, no intermediary. They were just bringing these people, these farmers, in and calling them independent contractors. Exactly. You Short and me. Finish. There's no middle middleman. And we'll just get along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. We have um, a, like a workability program for the students uh -huh. where, we, where we found like a welder. Um, and so they come in, they kind of do their own schedule and stuff, and mm -hmm. we classify them as just a 9 and 90, but that's not like the services we provide. Is that? I would say we should look at that. Okay, yeah. We should look at that because I think it's going to depend a lot on all of these things that we just talked about, mm -hmm. right? What, what's being what's being asked of them? How are we controlling what they're doing? Mm -hmm. I assume yes. We're probably requiring them to come at a specific time to teach the students about your thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. let's look at that. Let's talk after okay. with that. Um. So th so then we're going to go through. Obviously, we talked about the factors in like an overarching way. Now I want to talk a little bit more in depth about some of the specific factors and. Things that might trip you up or um, cause you to think differently about them. So looking at the independent occupation or business, is the person performing services engaged in occupation or business distinct from that of the principal? Just because the worker has their own separate business entity does not guarantee that they will be an independent contractor. So that's an important distinction because a lot of times companies will try to bring someone in as a 1099 and say, oh, they're not an individual. They have their own LLC. I saw the paperwork. I have it right here. That's not enough. Yeah. And, and I would tell you, I've had cases many years ago, like an unemployment appeal, where the ALJ said, yeah, you told that person 
to go set up that LLC <laughs> so that he could get the work from you. And that LLC is a sham. He doesn't do anything else through the LLC. He doesn't offer himself up to provide services to anybody else. He doesn't, you know, the LLC wouldn't have existed had you not tell, told him to set up the LLC so that he could get the work from you. So that's what Katie is talking about. That just the existence of it is not, you know, determinate. And definitely don't advise others as to what they should be doing with their own business. Yeah. <laughs> Stay away from that altogether. <laughs> <laughs> More handshakes. <laughs> so instrument, instrumentalities, tools, and place of work, whether the principal or the worker supplies those things. Providing equipment to a worker is often going to indicate that there's an employment relationship. So that's an important thing as well, is if they're coming in and you're saying, oh, I have everything you need right here, here you go. Well, you're all of a sudden providing them the means to do the work. And likely the manner, if, if you're telling them which tools to use, how to go about it, things like that. So pay very, very close attention if you're trying to bring someone in this manner, where those tools are coming, where the things that they're gonna need to perform whatever services are coming from. Expense reimbursement. What degree of investment does a worker make in equipment or materials required for work? So similar to what I, which, to what I talked about before, if you're in a specific line of work, you likely have very specific tools, how you like to perform the services, things that you require, um, whether it's your preference, preference or whatever it may be for the type of work that you're performing. Reimbursing a worker for business expenses is usually going to indicate an employment relationship. That's obvious, right? We, we reimburse our employees because if they're having to pay for it in, in conducting the business that we're asking them to conduct, we're going to reimburse them. In a true independent contractor relationship, independent contractors are going to factor in the cost of these additional tools, equipment, things of that nature into the contract with you. So they understand how much it's going to cost them to perform the work. This is similar to someone performing a minor home repair. They understand how much these things are going to cost, and how much the tools that they're, I mean, some of the tools that these people are using are quite expensive and also going to last them a significant amount of time. We're talking about tools that they could be using for services for the next five years. You're not going to reimburse them for their tools that they need to perform their work. That's something that they're going to bake into the contract price with all of the people that they have contracts with over the period of time that that tool is going to last. Are we in trouble if they send us like an itemized like invoice? For what kinds of things? So like um, I hire a uh, insurance broker mm -hmm. and we have like independent contractor. Um, and so he is a loss control consultant and he doesn't currently do this, but when he was, um, in, I'm sorry, I have another <laughs> okay. consultant that actually did, hey, we're gonna charge you for our travel. That to go visit you, we're gonna charge you for our travel. And that was- And it's not baked into the contract? It's part of it. Yeah, but I mean, they say the contract was five grand in travel expenses. So if it's, itemized, right? I mean, greater, yeah? but if it's baked in, that's much different than having a contract and then, then coming to you and saying, oh, here's an invoice. This is what you owe in addition to the contract. That you're okay. I think that would be handled separately. Still something that you should look at, but it's a very different scenario versus here's an invoice. I want this on top of the contract that I'm engaged in versus our, you know, section two of the contract talks about travel expenses or whatever it is. Okay. Type of occupation and skill required. What skill is required in particular occupation? And is the work of a kind usually done under direction of a principal or by a specialist without supervision? Generally, the less skill required, the more likely they're gonna be an employee. So like we talked about with those professional exemptions, things of that nature, people with high intellectual ability or a specific type of service that only they are classified to perform, that's very different than the lower level work that really anybody can come in and do. And it also does require a degree of supervision. Opportunity for profit or loss. Whether the worker has an opportunity to recognize a profit or suffer a loss based on his or her performance. Essentially, does the worker have skin in the game? And then length of time services are being performed. This is an important one. What is the term of the agreement between the parties? Open-ended or long-term relationships usually show an employment relationship which makes sense, right? If you're engaging someone to be 
on the books, so to speak, for some lengthy period of time, that's a much different relationship than a focused service being provided. So, and then the ability to terminate a worker at will, obviously that's our special employee language. Do not put at will <laughs> in anything you are trying to get with an independent contractor. That'll just be the end of it right there. So we'll see that language will be done. Method of payment. Um, is there a set hourly rate or salary? If so, likely an employment relationship. Um, if the worker is invoicing principal for services performed, so by the time or by the job, similar to what we just talked about, if they say, you know, in the contract, I'm going to perform X services, however I might get it done, who knows, right, how they're going to get it done, I'm going to pay this wall and it's going to cost you $500. We don't know how many hours that's going to take them, we don't know what the rest of that's going to be, but at the end of it, if the wall is painted, we're going to pay them $500. That's very different than coming in and saying, oh, we're asking this person to work two days a week at you know, eight, eight hours a day, and we're going to pay them this rate, and it just so happens to be around minimum wage. <laughs> That's going to be a problem. And then the party's understanding. Look at this. It's it's even an image. Right? <laughs> it's like it was just waiting for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're ruining your day. I'm sorry. We're always the bearer of bad news. Attorneys always get to be the bearer of bad news. I wish we had more good news. I'll work on it. <laughs> So the relationship the parties believe they created is a factor in the Borrello test, but not decisive. So if you've got 12 factors working against you, but you say, oh, he said <laughs> we were going to be an independent contractor, not going to work. Um, helps to document it, of course, but the existence of a written agreement for funding to establish an independent contractor relationship is not going to be enough. The second part, and probably most importantly, just because you're paying someone on a 1099 is not going to be enough. So saying, oh, I'm giving them a 1099 on a W-2, so it must be okay. <laughs> not going to work. And then brief review of Prop 22. So as Beth um, talked about, I don't think any of you guys are in this line of work. This is a very, very specific thing that came up, but we'll go through it anyway. It's also been in the news a lot. Obviously, this is a pretty fluctuating area of the law. I assume we're all familiar with Prop 22 just from using DoorDash. I don't know. <laughs> things that come up. We all, I'm assuming we all use you know, DoorDash, Lyft, Uber, all kinds of things. So it's, this is an exemption from the test for employee versus contractor. Um, and it's exemption from both. So that's an important part. The other exemptions we talked about exempted you from ABC, but you still had to do Borello. Here, Prop 22 exempts you from both. So if you meet this exemption, you're good. And it's applied only to app-based delivery and ride-share drivers. So I'm talking about your DoorDash, Uber, Lyft, whatever else the other ones are. Grubhub, there's so many now. Uber Eats, whatever the rest of them are. Supersedes and preempts any contradictory local regulations. And then industry-specific, obviously, this applies only to drivers who, through an online app or platform, either provide delivery services on demand or use a personal vehicle to provide transportation services. There are some limitations. So the network company, the DoorDash, the Uber, must meet the other requirements. Um, no minimum hours or prescribed days and times. A driver must be logged in. It's up to them when they perform their work. Driver cannot be required to accept any specific request to remain access. So obviously, if I'm sure we've all been in Uber at some point, they can decline whenever that pops up on their phone. Um, you know what? I want to go home and eat lunch. So I'm, I'm going to say decline. This is going to be my last ride for a while. I'll log back in in a few hours and see what I feel like doing then. Driver cannot be restricted to work for other companies except when engaged. So if you are giving someone a ride, you by no means can like stop and pick up coffee for your other employer <laughs> or whatever, right? Like if you're actually engaged in the work, you're required to be engaged in the work. But outside of that, you're free to do whatever you choose in terms of working for other companies. And then yeah, driver not restricted from working any other job. So it's really only, the only time you're restricted is if you are performing work for the Uber, right, Lyft, things like that. You can't also be simultaneously doing work for someone else. Which hopefully when they're driving, they're not doing that anyway. <laughs> yeah, so then what I think of because it's really a super lift, right? Mm -hmm. Is that you now see cars where it doesn't just say Uber, it's just brand them. Uh -huh. And sell them to them. True, yeah. But if they do something else that says that Uber car, it's been stopped that person. Right. Right, exactly. Yeah, you're not going to on your way yeah. to the location. 
let's stop and pick up a lift. And then by the way, let's stop and get someone's grub pub order. <laughs> That's a good way to make money if you are thinking really shady, but. And built-in protections. So some employee-like protections were built into this. Discrimination, harassment, prohibitions, guaranteed hourly earnings, 120% of the local minimum wage, and through, through um, December of 2021, 30 cents per engaged mile driven. So obviously that's important. Engaged means you actually have someone in your vehicle or a product if you're transporting it in your vehicle and you're actively engaged in your line of work. 12 in 24 hours work limits unless driver has logged off for six hours. I think we're all really happy about that one. <laughs> Nobody wants to get in an Uber if that person has been driving for the last 18 hours. I would be concerned. Um, healthcare subsidies if they're working over 15 hours a week. Medical and disability insurance coverage for on the job injuries, obviously car accidents pretty frequent, that additional protection. Background check and safety training, another thing we're all very thankful for. <laughs> and then Beth is gonna jump into this. I was just gonna note real quick, this, what, like I said before, this is constantly in the news. This area of law is very hot topic, hot button, so to speak. There was a case that just came out even yesterday about some amendments that were trying to be made to Prop 22 and whether there were some issues with constitutionality and um, who was responsible, I guess, at the end of the day for making sure that that was gonna be aligning with the constitution. It's constantly changing. This is not something you can rely on. I know none of you are in that line of work, um, but it, it's something to really pay attention to in the coming years. I think the independent contractor stuff in general and Prop 22 in particular, are bound to be fluctuating here pretty quickly. All right, and I'll pass it over to Beth. Right, Thanks for entertaining the crowd this morning. <laughs> moving like lightning speed, I actually am going to do this really quick, way, way back here. The multiple tests, this one, because I think. Uh, as we go in and talk about what the agencies can do and what the risks are, uh, it's helpful to, to make sure we're all clear on this. So Dynamax, when it created the, oh God, I forgot I'm supposed to be this. When Dynamax created the ABC test, it was dealing with claims under what are referred to as the California wage orders. I hope everybody in here knows what a wage order is because <laughs> we are supposed to have the applicable one for your company posted in your workplace, you can get them on the DLSC website if you are not familiar, but we have 17 of them uh, with industry wage orders and we have occupational wage orders. Um, so anyway, Dynamax, when it uh, announced the California Supreme Court that ABC was going to be the applicable test, it only was the applicable test when dealing with claims under the wage order, okay? So what was so important when AB5 was enacted and went into effect is that it said, we're gonna codify Dynamax and the ABC test, but we're gonna say now that the ABC test is a test not just for claims under the wage order, but claims under the California labor code, right? Which is wage and hour, health and safety, workers' time, you name it, right? I mean, the labor code just covers all kinds of areas. And uh, the unemployment insurance code. So it expanded the application of uh, the ABC test. The Borello test is used, uh, it was previously used under um, almost everything in California. And now we know based on what you just heard from um, Katie and Rachel that the Borello test is still going to be used uh, if we're dealing with any exemption under the statute, under the labor code to uh, the ABC test. Um, and then we've got, as I said previously, some other tests uh, under federal law. We also have the DFBH, which usually on a misclassification issue, if somebody claims I was misclassified and I'm an employee uh, and I've been harassed, they also used to uh, and, and will apply the Borello test. The key is it doesn't matter whether you're an employee or an independent contractor, you have protections against harassment under the DFDH, so they have jurisdiction to investigate. So I just wanted to go back and cover that. And now let's talk about um, some of the risks and penalties if we get this wrong. 
Um, there are quite a few. So we have state penalties. Um, I'll start by telling you that years ago, even before Dynamax and the introduction of ABC in California, we had agencies that were interested in this classification of worker because, and this may be me as a jaded defense lawyer, um, if you classify someone as an independent contractor, the state and federal government are missing out on a lot of revenue generation, right? You're not withholding taxes, you're not withholding unemployment contributions, SDI contributions, worker training, all of that. And so the IRS has always been interested in this classification, the DOL has, as have uh, the state EDD and uh, DLSC, labor commissioner. And years ago, the IRS entered into MOUs with 20 states, including California, that said, let's share our investigative and enforcement um, efforts so that if we get wind that there's a company that's violating the law and misclassifying their workers, We'll let you know and you do the same and that way we can kind of crack down on this together. So it's always been a priority of federal and state agencies to find those who misclassify and um, penalize them. And so uh, we have that MOU, it's still in place. There is a task force uh, in the state level between the labor commissioner, the DLSC's office, the EDD, uh, and DIR for OSHA, where they actually go out um, and look for non-compliance uh, in certain industries with wage and hour laws. And part of that is, have people been misclassified? I told you there are some, uh, some um, industries that are really on the radar, right? Janitorial, and um, they believe those are the um, kind of disenfranchised, abused industries where labor is uh, taken advantage of and they're not getting the benefits uh, of employment status. So we've got these various state agencies that collect taxes or wages. Um, the EDD, it has jurisdiction over income tax, unemployment insurance, UI and SDI, state disability insurance contributions. Uh, they can attack various penalties for misclassification against the employer or hiring entity. Um, and there's also even some criminal penalties. And I often get asked, well, how, how do they even know, right? How do they know? There's two ways um, often that I see it in my practice um, that this can get on the EDD's radar. One, you have an independent contractor that you end the relationship with. They all of a sudden say, I think I was misclassified. I'm an employee. I was an employee. I'm going to go file an unemployment claim with the EDD. They filed an unemployment claim with the EDD. The EDD has the discretion and the jurisdiction to evaluate whether or not that person was misclassified, right? And if so, then you're going to be on the hook for unemployment uh, benefits and potentially a bunch of penalties. But sometimes what happens in that one off, that one worker, is the um, hearing officer will say, or the ALJ will say, huh, how many others do you know are similar to you at the company? And if they say that there are more than one, two, three, four, you can be opened up to an EDD audit, right? As to the classification of your workers. So that's one way it can happen. The other way it can happen is by industry, right? The EDD learns that it's quote unquote industry custom to retain workers as independent contractors in certain industries. They go audit one company in that industry. And all of a sudden that industry becomes very uh, interesting to them. And they find all the other companies that are in that industry. And if they determine that 1099s are being filed instead of W-2s, they have the right to audit those companies. And so uh, the next thing you know, uh, you're being hit with what's called a pre-audit questionnaire letter where they're saying, we're going to audit you for the last three years. Um, and we're going to have this you know, initial meeting and have all these documents ready and tell us on that audit, pre-audit questionnaire they ask you to turn in. They say, how many employees do you have? And then they say, do you hire anyone to do any services that is not an employee? <laughs> yes. Well, OK, who? How many? And you have to fill that out. And then, boom, that becomes part of their audit. So that's how it comes up usually 
That's how you get on their radar. The other way is, and I don't know the credibility of this information, but I have talked many years with other employment lawyers who practice in this field, that there's algorithms at these agencies, the IRS, the EDB, and that if there is a significant number of 1099s being filed by a company each tax year, right, versus W-2, that that could also trigger um, an audit. Um, okay, the Workers' Comp Appeals Board, they also have an interest in misclassification, right, because we provide workers' comp insurance to our employees. Now, you can elect uh, on your policy to actually have it cover your independent contractors, too. But if you don't, and you're misclassifying all these workers, and one or more of them get hurt, uh, the board does have an interest, and they can um, institute a civil action against you for misclassification, they can actually even issue stop orders and stop your business from working until you get in line and reclassify your workers. Um, and there are penalties and sometimes even liens that can poke through a corporate entity or some other business entity into, um, into those who own that entity, shareholders. The labor commissioner, sometimes you hear me call it the DLSE, the Department of Labor Standards Enforcement, they have an interest uh, because they have jurisdiction over the enforcement of wage and hour in California, right, which is very hyper technical um, and very employee friendly. And so they're concerned about whether these, these workers who were misclassified were not properly paid wages. Um, and um, given meal and rest breaks um, and so forth, you know, proper itemized uh, wage statements, pay stubs, all of that, paid overtime. And so they can um, take action for past wages, interest, penalties, attorney's fees and costs. And in certain circumstances, if you're a licensed... Uh-oh. Ramon, I might have just messed this up. If you're a licensed... Usually the biggest number on the assessment, unless they found that you intentionally and willfully did it, the biggest number on the assessment is usually the actual number of um, personal income tax that wasn't withheld, right, for the workers. You can actually get that abated during that audit if you can establish that you, you know, filed tax returns, issued uh, legitimate 1099s, to those independent contractors because they have a duty to report those income taxes themselves. And so if you say, well, I did issue 1099 to them and you know, at that point they're supposed to uh, report their uh, income tax, that income tax number can be abated and reduced from the um, assessment and reduce the assessment quite significantly actually. Now you can only do that of course, if you um, settle up and you know, agree that you're going to reclassify uh, going forward. Okay, so the IRS can impose penalties against individual representatives of uh, a legal entity if there's a willful violation on the misclassification. Um, that means corporate officers can be at risk, right? Their personal assets um, if the employer should have been withholding um, personnel taxes. And then we have the DOL, the Department of Labor. Uh, they are similar to the California Labor Commissioner or DLSC, and they're interested in, of course, uh, the unpaid wages, interest, penalties, and they can also get attorney's fees and costs if they actually bring a legal action. Now, of course, that's government interest. As I said earlier, the actual individuals could have a claim also for misclassification. And these are two big cases that have actually been around for quite some time now, the Microsoft case and the Federal Express case. They were both class actions where the workers claimed that they were misclassified as independent contractors and therefore they weren't receiving benefits like other employees, like health insurance, retirement benefits, expense reimbursement, and they had significant liability when the court found um, in their favor. Um, and then, of course, we have, um, you know, um, medical coverage as well, right? You should have certain obligations under the ACA, depending on the size of your uh, workforce, to provide 
uh, medical insurance. And if you're classifying people as independent contractors to try and circumvent that obligation, there can be li liability under the ACA. And you know what we see, and we've got a couple of cases ourselves pending right now that we're involved in, that um, class action and PAGA actions, right? Everybody knows what PAGA action is here in California, Private Attorney General Act, all about the wage and hour entitlements of employees. You know, we see cases being filed that say you have misclassified this entire population of workers as independent contractors. And therefore, we're bringing a class action pot action against you for all these wage and hour violations. Every and, and it encompasses like every wage and hour violation that they can claim, right? Because you're not complying with any of them because you don't think they're employees. So they're very big cases um, and very popular. I will tell you, even though this isn't a wage and hour seminar, if you don't know or you didn't come to our year end, because I think we mentioned it. Um, there was enough signature, there were enough signatures on a referendum that's going to be on the 2024 ballot to actually try and get rid of PAGA. So I anticipate here towards the end of the year, we're gonna to start to see a lot of lobbying for and against that. So just make sure you vote for it, right? As business owners, you don't want PAGA, even if it means that we won't have cases to defend. <laughs> um, I think it's a bad law the way it's written and it should be done away with. Okay, here's something that a lot of people don't know. Years ago, I would say probably about a decade ago, we had legislation that enacted Labor Code 226.8 for willful misclassification. Um, and it states that you cannot willfully misclassify somebody as an independent contractor or charge a fee or take deductions from their pay if it would otherwise violate the law had the person been classified as an employee. And they define willful misclassification as trying to avoid, like you know the person should be an employee, but you're trying to avoid employee status by knowingly misclassifying that individual as an independent contractor. Now, how do you avoid this being attached to any misclassification claim against you? I think you have to do due diligence. Whenever you classify someone as an independent contractor, you should be consulting with counsel or at least be able to point to the evaluation you did to determine which exemption they fit in or which test you applied that you reasonably and in good faith determined the person was an independent contractor. Okay, if you've got something like that um, and you've got particularly reliance on counsel, you may be able to avoid this willful misclassification um, claim. And why does that matter? Is there federal or state? State, state. California, it's in the labor code. Why does it matter? Because if you are found to violate section 226.8, here are the potential penalties. Civil penalties between five and 25,000 per violation. License revocation if you're in a licensed industry, and then they have shaming penalties under this statute. They have shaming where they will require that you prominently post a notice on your website, or if you don't have one, in some public place at your place of business that tells employees and the general public for a year that you violated the law by misclassifying individuals as independent contractors. Okay. And in addition to this section, they have Labor Code Section 2753 tied to that that says, other than lawyers, we get a get out of jail free card. Um, if you work with a consultant, I don't know, a CPA who thinks he or she knows how to analyze independent contractor status, an uh, outside HR consultant, some business consultant, if they knowingly advise you to treat the person as an independent contractor rather than a worker, i.e. make, the, this is what I hear all the time. This is what I hear all the time. <laughs> and I hate to say it, I'm usually told by a client that their CPA told them, just make them a 1099 employee. A 1099 employee. There's no such thing as a 1099 employee. And as Katie or Rachel, one of you told you, said to you earlier, just by issuing a 1099 does not make somebody an independent contractor. 
So if that person knowingly assists and advises you in treating a worker as an independent contractor when the worker should be an employee, there is joint and several liability for that person, meaning they can be jointly and severally liable for the penalties and damages that come if they do from that misclassification. Now, it does not apply to attorneys giving legal advice, and it doesn't apply to internal HR um, or management people who are trying to discuss and advise and determine how they're going to classify someone, but it does apply to outside um, consultants. Okay, in addition to the government uh, agencies I've talked about already that have had this auditing and enforcement authority for years, way before we had Dynamex and ABC, we, um, we were given uh, the unfortunate news that there's gonna be broader governmental enforcement ability. And both AB5 and AB2257, and AB5 is the one that codified the ABC test after Dynamax, and AB2257 was kind of just the cleanup legislation on some of the exemptions. They said that the following government um, actors can actually enforce the laws with respect to misclassification. They can bring injunctions, actions, against a hiring entity who has misclassified uh, workers as independent contractors. And here they are. The California Attorney General has the authority. A city attorney in a city that has 750 or more people that live there or, or residents and any district attorney, okay? So those are all really busy, busy people, busy agencies. Not usually do they have the time and resources to all of a sudden become the ones who are going to enforce misclassification, right? They usually leave that to either the individual workers who think they're misclassified or those government agencies I just talked about, the EDD, the Labor Commissioner, IRS, and so forth. However, just last year, we had our first case with respect to a city attorney filing a lawsuit against a company under our Unfair Business Practices Act in our Business and Profession Code, 17200, based on the fact that this company was misclassifying its workers as independent contractors. The company's name is Maple Bear, but it does business as Instacart. You guys have probably heard of that company, right? So the city attorney sues Instacart under 17200. Well, what does that mean? 17200 under the Business Profession Code is our unfair competition or unfair business practices act. And the theory is, is that if you have a company who's not complying with certain laws in the state, that's unfair because other companies have to comply with those laws, right? So we see unfair business practices claims under 17200 attached to wage and hour claims a lot, attached to class action or even pocket claims, and it actually extends the statute of limitations an extra year to four years. We see that tacked on because the rationale or the argument is, hey, they're not complying with wage and hour laws and paying their people properly, or they haven't classified their people properly to comply with wage and hour laws, and all the other companies similarly situated in California have to do that. And so that's their, they get an advantage. It's an unfair business practice, okay? Well, governments have the ability to enforce the Unfair Practices Act. So the city sued Maple Bear under the Unfair Business Practice Act and said denial of employment protections for the independent contractors resulted in lost payroll tax revenue to the public, right? That's a public um, interest and unfair advantage against Maple Bear's competitors. Well, here's the issue before the court. Maple Bear had entered into arbitration agreements with all of those purported, quote unquote, independent contractors that it was doing business with. And so what Maple Bear said was, court, you have to compel this lawsuit that the city brought to arbitration because we have an arbitration clause with all of these individuals and therefore the question of whether they're misclassified should be determined in arbitration because the city is really just um, advancing their interests, right? The workers' interests in their classification. 
Court said, no, no, not going to do it. Court found the city wasn't a party, one, to the arbitration agreement, right? It's very hard to make a, some party go to arbitration if they didn't sign the agreement that said they'd go to arbitration. And the court said, they're also not even a third party uh, of interest or, um, what's it? yeah, third party of interest, right? Sometimes two parties sign an agreement, but there's another party that has an interest in it and you can sometimes enforce the agreement against them. Court said, no, they're not because they're not pursuing the individual workers' claims, they're vindicating public harms, public rights, right? No taxes being generated and unfair competition with their competitors. And the fact that part of the remedies that the city was seeking in this case is restitution for those workers, because under 17200, one of the remedies is that the injured party, if they prevail, gets restitution of the money that the person or the company um, recognized based on the unfair act. And so that restitution in theory would go to the workers that were misclassified, right, in this, in this lawsuit. But the court said the fact that part of the remedies the city seeks is restitution for the victims does not make the case private in nature and does not require the city to arbitrate it. So, you know, while the case was really dealing with the issue of a motion to compel arbitration and whether the city had to um, arbitrate or not, um, you know, is kind of a separate matter. But really why I wanted to talk about it is that it shows, right, that now this issue is on the radar of city attorneys or DAs who, again, I don't think have a lot of time, but if they find a company who you know, is misclassifying a number of individuals as independent contractors, they have the right to pursue that, that company in, in uh, a civil action. All right, here's my favorite little cartoon. I've used this cartoon <laughs> for years, probably decades. Uh, you can't fake independent contractor status, right? You cannot fake it. What do we do? What do we do? Due diligence. We start at the beginning. We know in California now, there is a presumption of employment, right? A presumption of employment if, so, if you're gonna retain somebody to perform labor or services. That the person is an employee and we have to, we think they could be classified as an independent contractor, do the due diligence ahead of time, okay? And, Start with the ABC test, look at the exemptions. Can you fit with any of the exemptions? You have to be able to either rebut the ABC test if you don't fit in the exemptions or go through whatever the required elements of the exemption are. You gotta meet all of them in the applicable labor code statute. And then if you do meet them, now go to your Borello test, analyze those factors, that's not an all or nothing test. It's a totality of the circumstances, right? Weighing of the factors. So you may have a factor that's not good for you, but if all the other ones are, you know, you can in good faith say that you think the person's properly classified. Do not assume or speculate just on somebody's title, just on somebody's expertise or experience that they are going to fit within an exemption, okay? This is very fact specific, case by case. And so just like you can't make an exempt versus non-exempt classification of your employees based on the job title, right? You have to actually look at what the employee does and how much time they're doing it and do they meet all the qualifications under the particular exemption. The same is true when we're talking about independent contractor status because you can say to a court or a regulatory agency, this person has an LLC and they call themselves a professional whatever, and we have an independent contractor agreement. They're an independent contractor. The court and the agency will say, okay, thanks for telling us that, we'll consider those, but none of those are determinative. It's all facts specific, totality of the circumstances. They're gonna look at the realities of the relationship. So don't ever just assume or speculate that someone's gonna meet a test. Also, 
If you do go through that due diligence and you in good faith determine that the person can be classified as an independent contractor, make sure that if you're giving them documentation relative to the services they're gonna provide for you, scrub anything that is employment-like, right? And don't make them sign your employee handbook and comply with employment policies. They're not an employee, all right? Now, it is possible, you know, Katie and Rachel both said that right of control, manner of means is the most important, right? But you can't control quality, control, and outcome, right? You want the benefit of your bargain. So, of course, you have an interest in, you know, whether they achieve the goal that you retain them for. You also can have certain pass-through policies. Let's say there's an industry standard or requirement in the way they do something or the end result of something. Or there's a licensing um, policy, you know, requirement and there's policies related to it. Those kind of pass-through policies where you say, look, we're not requiring this of you, right? This isn't something we're mandating or telling you how to do it. But there's an industry reg that requires this. There's a licensing um, reg that there are rules that requires this. All of that's fine to pass through and say, we expect you, as you do the work we've retained you to do, that you comply with these. Um, but don't give them anything that has any kind of employment related <laughs> verbiage. That's just going to muddle things up. Those are the kinds of things, documents that auditors are looking for. The other thing is be careful, you know, if you're issuing people um, phone numbers related to your business, um, business cards that are your business card with their name on it. Uh, you're requiring them to wear some insignia of yours in, when they're doing the work or have a sign on their truck that's yours. All of those kinds of things uh, auditors, investigators will look at because they're looking to find facts that indicate there's more of an employment relationship than an independent contractor relationship, okay? If you already have a person classified as an independent contractor and you're concerned as to whether they meet the applicable test, or you're getting ready to uh, engage someone and you think they may and you want to uh, try and classify them as an independent contractor, you may want to work with employment counsel when you're doing your due diligence just because remember every document you prepare, unless you're doing it in consultation and advice of counsel, is potentially discoverable, right? It can become potential evidence in an audit or a lawsuit. So um, I'm not trying to sell you my services or our services, but it's true that if you work with counsel like us and we guide and are involved with you and provide advice and counsel as you go through that due diligence, we can try and protect it within the attorney client privilege or attorney work product, okay? Because you may do some due diligence, create some documents that contain info, classify someone, and those documents will come back to hurt you, right? And potentially come back and show that you actually knew you should have classified that person. And next thing you know, we're now in the willful misclassification penalty um, arena. And uh, we have covered everything in, I don't know how much time we run, but I know we're early. Can we go back to pages? We can go so back, yeah. Uh, so what should, go back one page, not the other way, there. What should is spelled wrong. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's been bothering me and- <laughs> Thank you so much for I, giving me that typo. I'm gonna get to my copy I, editor. I'm just saying, just saying, just saying. Thank you. Now, yeah, uh, Ramona okay. is not just the organizer and the assistant of the LNE, she's also the copy editor. <laughs> you like to hire an independent person? <laughs> I think we need to outsource it. Okay. Yeah. First of all, why would a company as large as Instacart, not that they're a multi billion dollar company, but you would think they would have counsel here in California go, hey guys, I think I've seen, we need to talk, what's going on? They may have. I mean, I don't know. Obviously, when we read a case, we don't have all of that background, right? But um, yeah, here's the other thing I want to say to everybody online and in here. A lot of 
companies, even some of my clients, are, um, are very risk tolerant, right? There can be relationships classified as an independent contractor relationship that go all the way through to finality of whatever the contract was between the parties, and nobody knows of them except the two parties, right? No governmental agency ever gets wind of it. The contractor's fine, performed his or her services, got paid what he or she said they wanted, and they go on to the next uh, company. And, right, no problem. But, you know, sometimes, as uh, Rachel, I think, said, or Katie, things are fine when the relationship's going on. But if it goes sour or south, there's revisionist history, people can change their minds, and maybe that contractor now thinks he or she should have been an employee. Statute of limitations for these claims are pretty long too, right? Um, the other thing is, you know, so it is a risk tolerance, risk adversity question sometimes. You're just making a business call if you want to, but just know that if you do it, there is that risk. And if you do it without due diligence to show that you think you have a legitimate reason to classify them, there's the willful misclassification risk. Okay, so that's something to know. The other question I get a lot is, you know, Beth, why are you telling me that I can't classify this professional person as an independent contractor when I know in our industry that's industry custom? Or I know my competitor is doing that and they're getting away with it, nothing's happening. Well, I wish I had the crystal ball to tell you that just because it's industry custom or just because your competitor does it, you're going to be okay. But I don't. Because what I can tell you is I can pull two separate cases dealing with the same kind of relationship, you know, some professional service relationship where a court or a regulatory agency found one way in one situation and found the person was properly classified and found another way and said they were misclassified because it is so fact specific, right? And again, if it's industry custom and people have flown under the radar and never been burned by a suit or a regulatory agency, good for them. But it doesn't mean that they've classified their people correctly, right? So I always recommend that do that due diligence first, show the good faith, right? Before you classify as independent contractor so that if you do get dinged, at least you can show, I made every effort to do this appropriately. I shouldn't be hit with all these penalties, especially the willful uh, misclassification. So what's a good state for any to open up shop and hire as many 1099 employees? I've had, and that's actually a true and legitimate question. I have had clients, or tomorrow's my 25th anniversary at this firm. I will tell you, in the last two decades, I have had clients that have closed up shop and gone to Texas and to uh, Oregon. Uh, I had one many years ago that went through a terrible DOL audit, which is federal, um, but it triggered then state audit because of the MOU. They picked up and went to Washington, but Washington just caught up with California. So we're really not saving anything on there. We have a couple questions on the list. Okay. So the first question is, what can shareholders do to minimize liability for fines, if anything? Insurance? Insurance, uh, except I will tell you that most EPLI policies don't cover the kinds of claims that arise out of misclassification, mainly wage and hour claims. Those are usually uninsured claims. We are starting to see riders on EPLI where there's like a limited um, defense coverage for wage and hour up to a cap, but there's no indemnification coverage for the actual, you know, liability. Shareholders, you know, they may want to have some sort of um, agreement between themselves and the company with respect to indemnification if there is a, a piercing into shareholder liability that the company then indemnifies them. That's another possibility. Uh, the other question is, why wasn't Instacart protected under Prop 22? You know, this case didn't address that. The, the, the case that I read, the one that's uh, available to you to read on Lexis, I would venture to say that they're going to argue Prop 22 defenses in court 
This case was just dealing, before they started arguing the merits of the misclassification issue, whether or not they should have to do any court versus arbitration. So I venture to say Instacart probably will try to argue Prop 22, but remember, as Katie told you, Prop 22 may apply, but you got to make sure you're meeting all of those kind of quasi employee protections under Prop 22 to have have that um, have it apply to you. Yeah, is that it? Okay, good. Anybody else? All right, super. Well, thanks for joining us, guys. We uh, have uh, just a few things on the slide. If you, some of you, I know and I've seen for all these years, and I thank you for being loyal and sticking with us. We have some new, um, new resources that our labor and employment group puts out. I say new within the last year or so. Our California Employment News is a video um, service we provide. Quick, hopefully, we're not supposed to go longer than four or five minutes. Sometimes mine are a little longer. Um, where we're just trying to give you short little informative um, uh, pieces on either new legal developments or reminding you of best practices in the field of employment law. Uh, it is a video um, series that also is available now uh, in podcasts. So wherever you get your podcast, you can find us there. We really hope you join us on those, um, on those sessions. And then just so that you know what's coming up, and next month on April 12th, uh, the subject is the risk of retaliation claims. It's more than you think. Most people think retaliation only applies if somebody's retaliated against for filing a harassment complaint. I'm here to tell you, come to this seminar. I'm not one of the speakers, but I've taught this before. Almost every employment statute that offers an employment benefit to an employee will have an anti-harassment provision in it, right? So this is huge, 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 huge. All the different anti-retaliation provisions that are going to be discussed. And then how to inoculate your business against wage and hour lawsuits. Very important. That's going to be held uh, later uh, in August. So stay tuned for that. And then, of course, we offer twice a year mandatory harassment prevention training. If you have a supervisor or non-supervisor who has not yet had their required training and you'd like to send them to uh, training, we are going to provide it on June 8th and, oh, we don't have the next one. When is it? December? December 7th. Oh my God. Uh, June 8th, I think I'm teaching this one, right? So I'll be the one teaching that. So you don't have to have a certificate up on the wall now. Sorry? You now have to have a certificate saying, by the way, I'm no longer sexually harassing anybody in this work environment? No, you don't have to have it posted, but your employees, once they're trained, do have to have the certificate of completion issued. It will go into their personnel file, and it shows that they're trained for because it's a two-year, every two-year training, that they're good for two years. Whatever happened to the janitorial, um, like, I think it was like a few years ago, they were, there was um, something that came out that like your janitorial services needed to have. They do. Training. They do, and the DLSC has a whole page on okay. it. Yeah. Um, yeah, the DLSC has a whole page on that because it's got some uh, added elements separate and apart from AB 1825 training. Not like right around 20. Yeah. And I think we're done. Yeah.